Hello there friends, welcome back to another episode of Generation Tech. My name is Alan. One must assume that after tens of thousands of years of space travel, everyone would become more relaxed about space travel, spaceship maintenance, safety, and so on. I mean, just look at how many security checks and test runs we do here on Earth every time we're about to launch a manned mission of some kind. And it's definitely not what we're seeing happen in the Star Wars galaxy. I wonder if this is just the result of the normalization and proliferation of space travel amongst the general populace. Let's be honest, guys, a lot of things are going to change when space travel hits the masses. We're going to have Steve, who usually drives away from the gas pump with a hose attached to his car, piloting gigantic spaceships, for better or worse. So it's not just going to be scientists, test pilots, and engineers in space. Standards are going to be relaxed, and things are going to get a lot more dangerous. Mistakes are going to be made. And interiors are going to be vented out into exteriors. It's a terrible way to die, but it will make a good story. And so today, in honor of all those Steves out there, we're going to take a look at the eight most janky starships in the Star Wars galaxy. Sometimes the Jedi couldn't take their flashy starfighters into battle. And that's because the Jedi loved transitioning from being a military officer to an illegal combatant within seconds. While undercover and doing illegal things, Anakin Skywalker liked using an old G9 rigor class like freighter. This was a Karelian Engineering Corporation design, which means it's relatively modular and had some hidden compartments. The ship was formerly owned by Zero the Hutt, but the Jedi borrowed the ship on behalf of the Republic and basically never returned it. Now, what makes the Twilight janky, aside from the fact that it was used for illicit activities and smuggling? Well, there's the fact that the Twilight was shot down. I mean, sure, it landed in the sand dunes of Tatooine, but when you crash a ship once, you never know what kind of damage is done to the airframe and the internal structure. Plus, there's sand, which Skywalker hates. Now, fortunately, Skywalker does salvage this ship, and he kind of makes it into a master or apprentice project with Ahsoka Tano. He believes that it's very important for a Jedi to know his way around mechanical things. The Twilight would go on to endure some pretty crazy missions after it was salvaged. It would carry a rescue team inside of the separate superweapon known as the Malevolence. It partook in the Battle of Bathu Wai, and it was also used to find the cure for the Blue Shadow Virus. Ultimately, the Twilight was destroyed again, this time permanently when Obi-Wan Kenobi carried out an illegal mission to Mandalore in order to pursue an old love interest. So the Twilight is basically the Ford Bronco of the Jedi Order, and I'm pretty sure Anakin and Ahsoka Tano scratched off some serial numbers when they were, you know, rebuilding the ship. The Y-Wing should be respected, and that is because old things generally have a lot of wisdom. The Y-Wing has been through the Star Wars equivalent of World War I, World War II, and then the Vietnam War, aka the Clone Wars, the Galactic Civil War, and the First Order Resistance War. During the Clone Wars era, this ship would not have been janky. After all, the Y-Wing BTLB Y-Wing Starfighter from Conocer Manufacturing was considered state-of-the-art at the time. It was an excellent bomber, fighter, and provided great anti-capital ship capabilities and ground support all in one neat package. It could also do some light dogfighting if necessary. In many ways, the Y-Wing was kind of like the Cadillac of the Clone Wars, and that was because it was very long and not so maneuverable. And while it didn't have great agility, it did hold the straight line very well, even under heavy turbulence from flak and enemy fighters. And it's basically a cruiser on rails, which is a great platform to drop bombs from. It's really the Rebel Alliance who would make the beautiful BTLB Y-Wing into the janky ship we see in the original trilogy. This variant, classified as the BTLA-4 Y-Wing, was essentially a BTLB Y-Wing, but with the engine cover covers removed. They shortened the overall length of the ship, decreased weight, and also gave engineers quicker access to these ancient power plants, which oftentimes malfunctioned. The rear gunner turret was also removed in order to save weight, and also because the Rebel Alliance did not have enough crew and pilots lying around to basically operate a two-man assault fighter. The Y-Wing would serve at Scarif, Yavin 4, Endor, and every other major and minor battle in between. It was such a popular ship with so much nostalgia and history surrounding it that its manufacturer, Conestair Manufacturing, would basically cash in and create kind of like this retro styling Y-Wing inspired by the Rebel Alliance variant, but internally it was very modern with all of the new engines and hyperdrives and weapons you would expect in a modern starfighter. This ship was known as the BTANR2 Y-Wing, and yes, it would fly against the First Order and also go against the Sith Eternal Fleet. 
And so the ship goes from actually janky to hipster janky, which isn't actually jankiness, it's just the appearance of jankiness on the outside. It's essentially the uh, Triumphonaville, like that new one that has that fake carburetor on the outside. The MG-100 Star Fortress SF-17 was one of the most unfortunate vessels in all of the sequel trilogies. It seemed really out of place in a world of futuristic turbo lasers and, you know, terrible hyperspace drivers. And that's because there are obvious homages in its design to a World War II bomber like the B-17 Flying Fortress. I mean, come on guys, it's called the SF-17 Star Fortress. It's not exactly hidden. Everything from how the bomber crew is dressed to the cockpit window is designed to give us a feel from a different era. George Lucas did like to borrow things from World War II, especially when it came to weapons designs. I mean, is that a futuristic blaster or a World War II German machine gun? But the Star Fortress is just a bad design. It was thought up by Slain and Corporal during the Galactic Civil War. Now, Slain and Corporal does have some cool ships in their resume, like the V-19 Torn Starfighter, but the Star Fortress went wrong for many different reasons, which is why the Resistance's entire fleet of Star Fortresses were lost in the opening minutes of the engagement. I think they lasted for about three minutes. And that's because these starships were ridiculously slow moving, unarmored, and unshielded. What made them good was the fact that they carried a ridiculous amount of proton bombs, like over a thousand. But these proton bombs were basically dumb bombs and supposedly magnetically guided and not gravity assisted or something. That's kind of sketchy. Anyway, these ships were actually decommissioned by the New Republic once the war was over and used uh, for mining operations to blow up asteroids or something like that. And that's because these ships were really inefficient and generally good at only one thing, saturation bombing, just like the B-17 Flying Fortress was during World War II. Now this technique was neither efficient nor accurate and one might say highly unethical when used against crowded urban areas. Simply put, these ships were janky because they were really old and had been discarded and no one was really desperate enough to use them except for the resistance. Now I'm sure at one point in time the Razor Crest had a bright and colorful paint job. The ST-70 was originally designed for planetary defense forces and corporal security. But after far too many battles and run-ins with the authorities, the Razor Crest now sports a dull gray exterior that is functional and also designed to make it kind of low-key. But its owner is a bounty hunter who is a part of a dying group of people. The Mandalorian is constantly getting into space knife fights and constantly short on credits to repair his beautiful ship. In the first season alone, we saw the Razor Crest get bitten by a gigantic aquatic monster monster, completely taken apart and placed on cinder blocks by sketchy Jawas. It's also had one engine shot out by a bounty hunter Ace Pilot. And then in the second season, the Mandalorian is tasked with transporting a sentient lizard thing, and during that trip he gets chased by a few New Republic Rangers and ends up crashing his ship into an ice cave, and then later on into a salty ocean. By the end of the second season, the Razor Crest has been rebuilt multiple times, gone through some serious repairs, and during the last repair, a bunch of fish people worked on the ship, and so now it smells like fish, and key parts of the airframe are held together by seaweed. Which, unlike other organic materials like spider silk or dolphin leather, lacks both tensile strength and durability, and is not really designed for holding a ship together in space. Now, this is all before Moff Gideon just blasts the Razor Crest into pieces with a turbo laser. In case you guys are in the market for a new Starship, remember your standard collision insurance for a Starship does not cover orbital bombardment. The point is the Razor Crest is super janky and Dindarin does not care, because like his ship, Dindarin also loves taking blaster bolts into the face. And ultimately, I would not be surprised if the Razor Crest is somehow resurrected once again and made completely out of Viscar or something. Pond racing is probably one of the most dangerous activities in Star Wars, which is impressive because there are a lot of dangerous things in the galaxy. These vehicles are designed for only one thing, and that is speed. And so basically, they're just a cockpit strapped on top of a pair of extremely overpowered and overtuned engines. These engines can be sourced from everything, like starfighters, repulsor lifts, even industrial kind of buildings and factories. Anakin Skywalker's pod racer was definitely one of the most janky ones. It was scrapped together with random parts and utilized a pair of 620C racing engines from Radon Ulzer repulsor lift. These engines were attached by an energy binder and two cables that were attached to the cockpit. Essentially, Anakin is on a horse and buggy, but instead of horses, you have basically two rocket boosters and instead of a buggy, you just have this little pod that doesn't even have wheels or anything. Very, very dangerous. 
Everything on the ship was customized by Anakin, who loved tinkering with vehicles. The fuel injection system, for instance, was all custom designed. Then you have Sebulba, a rival driver who tries to sabotage Anakin's pod racer before the Boot Naive Classic even begins, rendering Anakin's ride even more dangerous. And that's not even factoring in the Tusken Raiders who line the racetrack and take occasional pot shots at the pod racers. I mean, this is definitely a very dangerous sport, and it's only made more dangerous by how janky the vehicles have partaken in it. Nothing says janky better than the ship that has pieces literally falling off of it. But when you're in the resistance and trapped in a salt cave on a desolate salt planet, surrounded by a massive army of salty space Nazis, you try to utilize whatever you have at your disposal. In this case, all they had was the V4X E ski speeder. These ships are supposed to be classified as high-powered assault vehicles, but clearly they were not stored properly by the rebel fighters who stashed these ships here. Most of these ski speeders are not structurally intact and very janky, and Poe Dameron immediately Flintstones one by accident after taking it out of the hangar. Apparently these speeders were designed to hover low across the ground, but they still needed a ski or a tether to guide them over terrain, which could only mean that these repulsors are not powerful enough to keep these uh, ships aloft. I mean, why else would this design be necessary? Do you really want to create a red plume behind your ship to serve as a guide for enemy laser fire? Judging by Ryan Johnson's ship designs, he's all about form rather than function. I mean, sure, it looks cool on screen, but does it really make sense? Anyway, the ski speeder is a depth trap. It's arranged like a B-wing for no reason, meaning the cockpit is offset. It lacks heavy weapons, and it also has no armor, let alone shields. Now, most of the ships we've seen so far are really dangerous because they're really old or they've been heavily modified from the factory settings. But there is another class of ships known as Uglies or Juice Cans or Buzzers, and these are probably the most dangerous ships in the galaxy because they are made up of a minimum of two ships bolted together. Oftentimes used by scavengers and bandits, these Uglies are a mismatch of your favorite galactic Civil War fighters that no one ever asked them to make. You have things like a tie wing, or is it an X-tie, or a Y-tie, my tie. The point is, most of these ships are garbage and not designed for space flights, and can and will come apart at the seams, literally. Corellian ships get a bad rap. For one, it has to do with the fact that Corellia is viewed as the New Jersey of the Star Wars galaxy. And the problem with people who talk rap about New Jersey, I mean Corellia, is that they've probably never been there and properly explored its less toxic and street urchin ridden regions. Corellia is alright, and the ships they create are more than alright. Which is why oftentimes the most crafty and often credit strapped individuals swear by a good old fashioned Corellian freighter. These are very much the F 150s of the Star Wars galaxy. They're built to be highly modular, and they have some pretty decent specs straight out of the factory. The Millennium Falcon, at one point in time, for instance, was a YT 1300F light freighter, which mainly was used as a tugboat in orbital shipyards. It was brought at one point in time by Lando Calarizian, who not only had great taste, but access to some of the best aftermarket parts in the galaxy. Unfortunately, a man man named Han Solo happened to the Millennium Falcon. He would attempt to do the Kessel Run in the Corellian Freighter, except he essentially cut a few corners around the course and goes right through the out-of-bound areas, which are out-of-bounds because they are full of thick clouds of debris, and the occasional deep space leviathan, and of course black holes. Oh, and the Empire is also chasing them this entire time. And so the ship gets a little damaged, and because Han Solo never seems to be able to scrap together enough credits to actually repair the ship, the Millennium Falcon, is forever janky looking. There's carbon scoring all over the place, missing sensor dishes, and the aftermarket escape pod is completely gone, along with many of the aftermarket armor plates that used to kind of line this ship's exterior, giving it a pretty clean look, in my opinion. Then there are the not so well maintained internal systems. The Falcon might have a class 0.5 hyperdrive, which is the fastest in the galaxy, but when that breaks, which happens quite often, the Millennium Falcon is using a backup class 10 hyperdrive system, which makes it definitely not the fastest ship in the galaxy. So there you have it guys, those are eight extremely janky vehicles that can be found in the Star Wars galaxy. Now just because the captain of that janky ship is comfortable with flying his terribly maintained ship doesn't mean that you have to. Because if it looks terrible on the outside, most likely the internals are also pretty bad. Now let me know in the comment section below if I've missed any of your favorite janky ships that aren't on this list. And also don't forget to subscribe and hit that notification button down below so you don't miss out on the rest of our content. As usual, thanks for joining us today. If you're watching this, you are Generation Tech.